But hope, although it is maybe a uh, complex emotion, it is universal in that everyone needs hope. Uh, when hope is lost, uh, men are at their worst, they're at despair. And so hope is something that we are constantly looking for, and hope is part of Christianity. Jesus Christ was constantly giving his men reasons to hope. He was constantly moving us forward. Even at the time of his death, he had said to them, listen, you can't go where I'm going right now. Well, see, that's very unhopeful. I can't go where you are going to be now, he said. But, and then he changed it around and says, but where I am going, you too will come. So immediately with the bad news, he gave them immediately a source of hope. So hope is an important aspect of our Christian life. And it is what Jesus Christ is all about. So we have to ask ourselves, and at times, why is our hope so weak? If Christ is the source of hope, if Jesus Christ himself is our hope, then why does our hope from time to time become so weak? And I guess we have to answer that. What's our relationship to Jesus? How are we doing with him? So let me consider with you a few points in this. First of all, here is our theme. Jesus Christ who is our hope. That's what this whole message is going to be about. It's going to be about hope and what Jesus Christ does to motivate and inspire and move that hope along because it is an essential part of Christianity. You can imagine if you were a Christian and you had no hope. One of the things Paul reminds us of is that in grieving, for example, when we lose people, he said we grieve but not as those who have no hope. So it understands then that we must be having hope even in the moment of grief we have hope. And so Jesus Christ, because if you have Christ, you have hope. And that's what Paul wants us to know. So let's take a look at first of all, the Lord Jesus Christ gives his disciples new objects of hope. The world has always looked for hope in some regard. But Jesus wants us to understand that hope consists really in a couple of things. It is a desire and an expectation. Something that I want and something that I not only want, but something I believe that I can gain. And so we consider then in Jesus Christ giving us some reasons or objects of hope. First of all, we hope in our relationship to the Father. You have been e adopted by the Father. You are joint heirs with Christ. A reason for hope in Christianity is the fact that the change in my relationship to God. God's not just out there somewhere. God's not hidden to me. God to me now is my Father. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father. That changed everything when God became my Father instead of just God out there in the wilderness somewhere. It changed. It made me hopeful because if God's my Father, does he then have responsibility to me? Does a father have a responsibility to his children? Legally, yes. Particularly under the Jewish system of law that they lived under, the father had a responsibility to provide for his family. And so you and I then are certain if God is a law abiding person, and he must be because he created laws, and therefore if God's law abiding then, and he said he was our father, then did he carry in his mind the fact that he has a responsibility now to us? That's a great reason for hope. If God is careful for me, and if God wants to provide for me, I have a new reason for hope, and that new reason is God is my father. But not only that, I have a hope now, based on Jesus Christ, of the forgiveness of my sins. My sins are gone. My sins are paid for. This Jesus Christ wanted us to absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt that all my sins were gone. That he washed them all away. That he took my place and my sins, every last one of them, were taken to the grave with him. And there they were buried. And sins did not come back with him. Only glory came back with Jesus Christ. So therefore my sins have been changed. And now from glory to glory I will be with him. I don't worry anymore about the penalty of my sins. I don't worry about what my sin might cost me. That's all gone. Jesus Christ paid it all. That's another reason for hope. So God is my father. My sins are all gone. 
Here's the thing. When I die, there's a new hope. I don't go to the grave and stay there. Jesus Christ proved that there was life after the grave and he would be the first to lead us there. This was a hope. Oh, some people have always thought about it, but Jesus Christ guaranteed it. He proved it by his own resurrection. We have hope. We have the right now to desire and to expect to receive. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. He said that while he was still alive. He said that before he had died. So then he died to prove it. When he was dead for those three days, all hope was gone. Then suddenly he comes back and with him, we're told that the disciples began then to remember all the things that Jesus taught them. And one of the things that he has taught them was, if I go away, and he hadn't gone yet, but he went to the grave and he came back. Then he ascended up to heaven with this promise, I will return. Well, hey, if he can go to the grave and come back, he can go to heaven and come back. Because isn't that where he came from to begin with? And so all of a sudden now we have hope. We have hope that God's our father. We have hope in the forgiveness of our sins. We have hope as heaven is our home and hope that we are not going to go to hell. We are escaping hell forever and heaven instead will be our home and we will live and dwell there. And there were a host of other things that Jesus Christ wanted us to know. But not only if he was going to take care of my eternal state, then is it possible that God also was going to take care of my temporal needs? That he would provide all my needs in Christ Jesus. So not only the eternal, not only the unseen promises, but through this life. My wife and I, as my son had said, have gone through 40 years. And in 40 years, we're still here. In 40 years, God has provided and God has taken care. There were times when things got pretty lean, but there was never any time when God did not provide. And so we as young kids back in those days looking at it, wow, how are we going to make it? And here we are now as grandparents looking back and say, wow, look at how we made it. And uh, that's our hope that God not only takes care of my eternal, but he's also going to take care of my earthly. After all, he is my father in heaven. And if he's my father in heaven and he knows where I'm at, he knows where I'm, what I'm going through, and we said already that he has a responsibility, not just to me when I get to heaven, but he's got a responsibility to me right now. He has a responsibility. When my parents sent me off to school, I wasn't the school's responsibility. I was still my parents' responsibility. And if I misbehaved in school, guess what happened to me when I got home? The school would call my mom and they would say to her, hey, you better beat that kid a couple of times. And mom said, sure. <laughs> You know, and boy, she'd light your tail up. Why? Because it wasn't the school's re Now, granted, the principal whacked you. He took you in that room, gave you that old board of education, right? But when you got home, every parent that you passed on the way home, first of all, would cuff your Mickey bowl for being a bad kid. And then when you got home, your mom just laid into you. And let me tell you, you didn't do it too often in school because you knew you was in big trouble. Mom had a responsibility as my mother to raise me. The school didn't. And that's a big difference. Everybody thinks it's a school's responsibility today and parents are abdicating their responsibility, but it's still the responsibility of parents to raise their children. And if that's true and God's my father, then does he still have responsibility for me? It wasn't the school's responsibility to make sure I ate lunch. It was my mother's responsibility, as poor as we were, when she shipped us off, all eight of us, she had to make sure that we had something to eat for lunch. And so we did. And it wasn't gourmet or anything like that, but it kept us alive and we would eat. That was all her responsibility. She didn't give up her responsibility just because I wasn't at home. And the same thing, just because I'm not home in heaven, God hasn't di dis uh, di uh, discarded his responsibility to me. Even though I am away from home and here, he still has a responsibility as a father to care for me. And so... Jesus wanted his disciples to know that, hey, don't worry, God will take care of your temporal needs as well as your eternal, as well as my sins being gone. I will also have my needs here taken care of. The book of Proverbs says that God's children have never been begging for bread. And so here I am, and God has taken care, and we appreciate so much his love and kindness to us. But that's not all Jesus wanted us to know. Secondarily, Jesus Christ also, he lays a new foundation for an old hope. Um, 
Before our discipleship to Christ, our hope was in temporal goods. Our hope was, okay, I'm going to get... You know, if you read the Old Testament, the Old Testament, they always said, Lord, give me, give me, give me. And the Old Testament prayer is always about giving me my earthly stuff. But Jesus told us, you don't have to even bother praying about that kind of stuff. Your Heavenly Father knows what you have need of before you even ask. Trust Him for it. But he wanted you and me to begin praying outward. He wanted us to begin to pray for those around us, the salvation of the lost and dying world. Begin to pray for those in need around us, to begin to pray for one another. So, you know, here's the changing, this, this idea of our hope is no longer built on money, no longer built on skill or energy, but rather our new hope is built on Jesus Christ. You can do nothing, he reminds us. Without me, nothing. With me, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So as long as I am in this world, I don't have to worry that much about failure. If it's something that I can do for Jesus Christ, and he will enable me to do it. Our marriage was given to the Lord. We both made promises to God. And here we are 40 years later keeping those promises. And it was really an easy promise to keep because we made it to God. And of course the Lord's then going to help us to keep it because it brings honor and glory to him for us to do so. So here we are with this new foundation, as I said already. The new foundation for our hope is our relationship to the Father. We are joint heirs with Christ. You wanted us to know that. Everything he owns in heaven. The Father, he said, all power, all power has been given to me in earth and in heaven. Everything that the Father owns, he has placed in my hands. And then he says, and I am going to share that with you. You and I will be joint heirs together. We will own all things equally. Wow. Wow. That transformed everything about my hope. It changed its location. My hope is no longer based in the things of this world, that which I can acquire. It's not based in my accumulation of things, but it's based in Christ owning everything. His ability to go far beyond my own. His ability to provide where I could not. You know, here as a church, we try to be part of world missions. We don't have the money to support all the missionaries of the world. But collectively with Jesus Christ at the helm, he can help, we can help him as he provides for the needs of the world. And he can make it go much further than we ever could. So, there's also this part. Our Lord constitutes himself the secure foundation. It is Jesus himself that is the foundation of our hope. In his own personage. All lawful hopes we found in him. Old or new. All that we have. The Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation. No other foundation has ever been laid. Than that which is laid. Jesus Christ. His death, burial and resurrection. The person of Christ. Who he claimed to be who he proved himself to be, is our foundation stone. And so we know that Jesus Christ is. We know who he is and what he is. We know what he can do and what he has done. And our hope springs from his ability and from his very person. The fact that Jesus Christ is God gives us reason to hope in him. This, who he is, constitutes our reason for even having hope. The government will be upon his shoulders, we're told. Our future is secure because it is all found in Christ. Everything that we look forward to is either in him or about him. The fact that he stands ever before the Father's throne, he is the sacrifice that continually mediates for us, continually forgives, continually washes us clean. 
Those of you who have taken a shower only need to have your feet washed, he said. And so he has bathed us in his blood, but because we walk in a sinful world, we are stained from time to time with it upon our feet. And so even at that, the blood of Jesus Christ washes us clean every day, every day. I can always turn to him and say, Father, I'm sorry. Forgive me. He said, listen, you're clean, but your feet's a little bit dirty. And then he washes our feet for us. So we look at his sacrifice. We understand that he secured our position, our possession and position. And then that all power is given to him both in heaven and in earth. That's pretty secure stuff. All in heaven and in earth. What does the earth have? I don't know, but whatever it's got, it's his. What does heaven contain? I don't know, but everything it contains is his. I haven't seen but half the world. On the other half, I take by faith that even exists. Because I've only been to this half. Maybe that half doesn't, I don't know. People tell me, they show me pictures of it. I haven't been to Europe, but they tell me it's there. I've seen pictures on TV. I've been to the Orient. I can tell you that it's there. I've been to the Pacific. I know that that exists. I've never sailed the Atlantic Ocean. Maybe it doesn't really exist because I haven't been there. But see, I know it does. And although the things that I have not, I haven't seen all the things that the earth possesses, but he has. And whatever all of this stuff is, he owns it all. It's in his care. And all of, I have seen none of heaven. But all that heaven possesses and all that it is, he owns that too. And all these things are in him. And he calls himself my savior. But more importantly than that, he calls himself my friend. I don't call you servants. I call you friend. Because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have told you everything that the Father is going to do. And so, I read the Old Testament, I read the New Testament, I go through the book of Revelation, and guess what? I know what the Father is about to do. Because my friend and Savior told me what our Father is about. That's pretty solid stuff. Jesus Christ himself then constitutes my foundation. Not only does he constitute it, but Jesus Christ himself is my hope. He is. He has promised to come again. And those who love him wait for him. See, that's my hope. My hope is that he is coming. I'm not hoping for the end of the world. What do I care if the world ends or not? So long as he comes. That's what I'm looking for. All of my hope, this hope that springs within us, this hope that promises to change my life, this hope that promises to help me live for Jesus Christ is all found in my believing that he's coming back. My believing his word when he said, I will return. I believe it. No one knows the hour of the day. All right, I can understand that. I don't know when. If you were to ask me, Pastor, what day is Jesus coming back? I don't know. I could make up a date if you'd make you feel any better. But then you'd be disappointed when I give you that date and it doesn't happen. Because he said no one knows the day or the hour. So I don't know the day or the hour. But I know this much. I know he's coming back and that is my hope. My hope, as I said already once to you before, to me, the grave is a possibility. But Jesus coming back is a guarantee. I am going to heaven. That is guaranteed. I might, I might go to the grave. The whole world understands that they're going to go to the grave. That's their hope. Their expectation is that everyone, for all have sinned. We know that. And therefore, all are going to go to the grave to pay for their sins. But not us. See, I got to hope that they don't. My hope is if Jesus Christ should come, he is going to take me to heaven without ever seeing the grave. I might see the grave. But I will see Jesus Christ in the flesh. I will be in heaven with him forever. And so Jesus Christ is not only the foundation of our hope, but he is our, he is hope itself.
I have read about people who have no hope. I have heard of people who have no good hope. I have heard of people who have a hope without worth having. No hope in their soul. No object for their hope. They call out, they have desires and expectations, but they don't expect to see them brought to, to pass. But for us, I have the right to desire. I can desire to see Jesus Christ. I could desire for the day when he breaks through the clouds. I have that right to desire that. I have every right not only to desire, but I have every right to expect because he said it. If he said it, then I have the right to expect it. And so, I look at Jesus Christ, who cannot lie, and I read the words that he has read. If I go away, and I have to ask myself, did he go away? Well, I have a report that tells me there on the Mount of Ascension how he went up to heaven, how his disciples were standing there and how the angel said to those men, why do you stand here looking up? That same Jesus that you saw leave, that same Jesus will come again in like manner. The same way you saw him go is the same way that you'll see him come back. I've got the angel's words on that. I've got God's word on that. I got Christ's promise. How do I know he keeps his promise? Because he said, put me in the grave. And in three days, I'll rise again. Did they put him in the grave? Yes. Did he rise again on the third day? Yes. Does he keep his promise? You better believe it. So I have a reason to hope, and that reason is Jesus Christ himself. Hey, the reasons that he's given, the hopes that he has given, the foundation that he has laid for all that, and the fact that he is hope itself, that's what we look forward to. See, the errand of Jesus Christ when he came into this world was not to become a great teacher. It was not to become a reformer. But rather he came to die. He came to die a ransom for sinners. Of whom there are two classes. There are those sinners who think themselves righteous and there are those sinners who feel the weight of their sin. Christ died for both. But only one will accept what Christ has done for him. Like Paul who claimed himself to be righteous before God. Like that publican and that Pharisee in the temple. The publican who said, Lord be merciful to me a sinner. And that publican who said, or rather that Pharisee who said, I thank you, I'm not like other sinners. I do this good thing and this good thing. And Jesus said, you know, it was that man down there that went away justified. So to a lost and dying world, I say we're all lost and dying. But those who ask for forgiveness of their sins, those who would say to God, Lord, I know I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. They will go to heaven. Two thieves died on the cross. One said, hey, why don't you save yourself and us? And the other simply said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And it was to that man that Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Only one of the thieves, there were two of them, on the left and on the right with him. But only one of those men went to heaven that day. It was the one who asked. The one who acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord. And so we encourage those of you here and those listening around the world. Today, acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. Lord, remember me in your kingdom. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, forgive me my sins and take me to heaven when I die. And you too will be justified. Let's pray.